Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Wednesday. I hope everyone has had a great week that you are staying healthy, you are washing your hands, you are covering your cough and all that good stuff and staying home if you are sick and maybe skipping the visit to the nursing home for the next few weeks because we're all trying to take every precaution that we can to make sure that we and those that we love stay healthy, right? That's what we're going to talk about just a little bit more today. I know we talked about the coronavirus last week and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of talking about this, but hopefully I'll offer a a perspective that is refreshing, that is comforting while still realistic and one that you haven't heard over and over again. I do think it's important that we stay in the know on this and that we don't just push it to the side and pretend that it's not happening, that does a disservice to ourselves and to those around us. So we're going to talk about that, not for too long, but we are going to dive into it, then we're going to finally get to a little bit of the AOC monologue that she gave in regards to religious liberty. And then we are also going to touch on, if we have time, some election update and uh, the latest Supreme Court case in which or about which a lot of liberals are mad, especially Busy Phillips. So I'm going to try to get to all of that and maybe even more if I have time, but I got to go uh, kind of quickly through it. Before we get into it, though, let me tell you guys about a sponsor, Laurel Spring. So as parents, We really want to encourage our children to uh, pursue the things that God has gifted them in, provide opportunities that give them the best chance to succeed. Sometimes that means optimizing their routine, making it more flexible, making it more dynamic, more personalized to them so they have more time to focus on the things that they love and are really good at. And that is why Laurel Springs exists. So Laurel Springs, it's an accredited online private school for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. And let me just tell you, if you're worried about your kid getting sick, this is a really good option. Uh, Laurel Springs recognizes that each child is a unique individual with their own personal interests, special talents, unique learning style. Their flexible learning program offers challenging and diverse elective courses. Laurel Springs is accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges and Advanced Ed, which means their transcripts are recognized by colleges and universities worldwide. So that's great news. You can register your child at laurelsprings.com slash Allie, A-L-L-I-E. You will receive a waived registration fee if you do, and that is awesome. That's laurelsprings.com slash Allie for your waived registration fee. That is laurelsprings.com slash Allie. Go check it out. Just learn a little bit more about it. You've got nothing to lose. Okay, so coronavirus. Things aren't looking great, Things aren't looking as bad as they could, but they're also not looking great. So we've got the death toll that is rising. We've got the number of infections that are rising. We've got the number of community infections that are rising. We've got people who haven't traveled outside of the country, just maybe have traveled to another state or haven't traveled at all. They've come down with the coronavirus and it's very hard to figure out where they actually got it. It's one thing if everyone who has it in the United States, we know that they either visited Italy in the past couple of weeks, or they visited Iran a few weeks ago or recently or China. But when we have people in California and even in Texas just showing up with the coronavirus and of course, a lot of other states as well, uh, but showing up with the coronavirus without any known source outside of the United States, of course, that's when things get a little bit panicked because it becomes much harder to con- uh, to contain. We've got an incubation period. So that is the period that uh, you have coronavirus inside of you, but you're not actually showing symptoms. The average is 5.1 days. So you could go 5.1 days with the coronavirus. You're walking around, you're breathing on people, maybe you're coughing here and there, and you're getting that on people. You're kissing your spouse or your baby, and you have no idea that you have probably infected those around you because you don't have any symptoms and you don't think that you have it. That's one of the unfortunate things about coronavirus. So there are two extreme reactions going on right now in the media, maybe even among your friends about coronavirus. One extreme reaction is that we should absolutely be panicked. We should be freaking out. Everyone needs to go to the store, get toilet paper, uh, get all of the apocalyptic things, spend $5,000 on 
freeze dried food that you can, you know, have for the next 25 years, just in case we're quarantined for the next couple of decades. That is one reaction. And uh, in the media, it's manifesting itself in a very political way that we talked about last week, saying Trump is incompetent. His administration has no idea what they're doing. Trump doesn't care about this. He doesn't care about people. He just cares that he is protected from this. He is such a failure. He is so inadequate. Uh, that obviously is an incorrect reaction. All of the absolute panic, the blaming on President Trump and his administration for this is absurd. It's not based in fact. It's not based in any kind of reasoning whatsoever. It is just a way to try to drum up panic and outrage that is going to work against President Trump. Now, not everyone who was freaking out is against President Trump, but a lot of the people, particularly in the media, who are freaking out, who are trying to make Make this bigger than it is. And like I'm going to explain, I do think it's something that we should care about, but they're trying to make it even bigger than it is because they know that it is an advantageous strategy against Donald Trump, not just to continue to um, hurt the market and hurt the economy. I don't know if that's you know their deliberate intention, but that is what's going to happen, but also just to make President Trump look bad. And like I said, last week, if that is your motivation, that that's shameful because what it looks like. And again, I'm not saying that the people who are drumming up this outrage and making it bigger than it is and blaming this on Trump when they shouldn't be blaming it fully on Trump. Uh, I, I'm not saying that this is their direct intention. I'm just saying this is what it looks like when you are using something like a deadly virus to work against your political opposition or against someone that you don't like. It makes it seem like you like the panic. You like the pandemonium, uh, or at least you have like a morbid uh, interest in it and a, a morbid satisfaction in it, it makes it seem like you are using people's death to your political advantage, which then makes it seem like you're okay with more people dying. Now, again, I don't think that that is the true motivation of people who are using this against President Trump. I'm just saying it doesn't look good. It doesn't look like the compassionate, like the reasoned response because because if you were drumming up all of this outrage and all of this panic, uh, it's not good for the collective. It's also not good for the individual. I was on the anger mangle on Monday night. And I talked about that actually individually having this kind of uh, nervousness, this kind of anxiety all of the time, this kind of negativity, thinking that, for example, the president is out to get you and that he has completely left America by the wayside and he's totally abandoned us and having all of this negative energy constantly spewing hate on Twitter, whatever. I mean, there are people who are saying they hope President Trump get it on Twitter. I mean, that doesn't represent, obviously, everyone on the left or everyone who doesn't like Donald Trump. There are gross people on both sides on Twitter, but there are these kinds of arguments on Twitter saying, oh, this would be karma. This would be justice if people at CPAC uh, got uh, got the virus, if President Trump, if Mike Pence got the virus. There are people that are saying that, oh, this would be great vengeance. This would be justified or this is, uh, this is what they get for saying that coronavirus was a hoax, which, by the way, Republicans and President Trump never said that coronavirus was a hoax. So if that is uh, your mentality and if that is what where you are spending your time and spending your energy, that's not good for even your individual immune system. Like that negativity uh, suppresses in a way your immune system. The more anxious we are, the less sleep that we're getting, the more angry we are. Like it actually has a negative uh, physical effect on your health. And so again, people who are drumming up this outrage because it's politically advantageous, because they don't like Donald Trump, drumming up panic in order to cast a narrative against Donald Trump is doing a disservice to themselves, doing a disservice to their listeners, doing a disservice uh, to all of the people who are in their influence, even just on an uh, immune system level. Uh, but also, of course, it it isn't good for the economy. Now, my number one concern isn't that, uh, oh my gosh, the, the markets aren't doing well. Obviously, that's a really big deal. 
obviously that really matters, but I'm not going to encourage people, hey, go out, hey, travel, hey, just keep on doing whatever you're doing or else the economy is going to go bad. Because that to me also seems like the other side where people don't want the economy to stall just because they want President Trump to be cast in a good light. I obviously don't think that's the right reaction either, but we'll get to the other side in just a second. So the one bad side is absolute pandemonium, absolute panic, absolute freaking out, which like I I said is unhealthy in more ways than one. And then the other side of this, um, now, like I said, Republicans aren't saying that this is a hoax. I don't know of anyone in the media who has said that this is a hoax. President Trump said that the, the liberal media's reaction or narrative about him not caring about this is a hoax. He never said coronavirus is a hoax. And from my perspective, even though not all of his press conferences have been perfect, I don't think all of his tweets have been helpful hey, what's new? I have always thought that about his tweets, but um, I have not gotten the feeling that he doesn't care about this. Like I have not gotten the feeling that President Trump is complacent about this. Even if you think that President Trump is this narcissist who only cares about himself, even if from that perspective, it wouldn't make sense for him to not care about the coronavirus. Like that would, in the most superficial sense, not be good for his uh, election, re-election possibilities, right? So even if you think he's selfish, it doesn't make sense for him not to care about the coronavirus. I don't think he's selfish. I actually think that he does care about what's best uh, for the American people in this case. Hopefully, the hope is in all cases, but especially in this in this case, I'm not afraid to criticize President Trump when criticizing criticism is justified. And by the way, I don't think he's immune from criticism just because we're in the middle of in of an epidemic. I think it's okay for people to issue legitimate criticism towards him. But I do think, like I said, the pandemonium and the absolute panic and the ginning up outrage for the sake of political advantage is wrong. But um, I don't think that he's complacent and I don't think that kind of criticism is justified. So, however, if there are any people on the other side of the spectrum who are complacent, who are saying this is not a big deal. People just need to go on with their lives and forget that it happened. People just need to wait till this gets out of the out of the uh, news cycle. Oh, the flu kills a lot more people every year. We shouldn't worry about this. Yes, the flu does kill more people every year, but this is different. We've had the flu since basically the beginning of modern medicine. Uh, We haven't had the coronavirus. There are different kinds of coronaviruses, but we've never had this particular coronavirus. And so our internal defenses just aren't quite as prepared to handle the coronavirus or COVID-19, the Wuhan virus, whatever you want to call it. We'll get to that part in a second. We're just not as equipped uh, immune system wise to be able to fight something like this off. And the death rates really don't look good for senior citizens and even for people over 60 people over 60 are getting uh, infected at higher rates than uh, young and healthy people. But there are people who are young who have been infected and who are not doing well uh, because of this virus. So it's not exactly like the flu. We obviously don't have a vaccine against the coronavirus. And I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people are skeptical about vaccines. A lot of people have really good reasons for that. So I'm not trying to start that conversation right now. But that is one reason why coronavirus is different from the flu. Um, So it's the comparison. And Trump has made this comparison. And I totally understand he's just trying to reassure people. I don't know that it's an apt comparison. It's just different. It seems to be hitting the population differently. It seems to be spreading uh, a lot. And look, here's one thing I want to say. So, well, let me finish this first. So the pandemonium is wrong. The absolute complacency or apathy or pretending like this is not a big deal and isn't going to affect our lives and we should just ignore it. That's wrong too. Uh, This is something that is happening. This is something that may affect our lives. This is something that we should care about, that we should take uh, precautions for because both sides of this reactionary perspective are unloving, especially from a Christian perspective. If we are called to love our neighbor as ourself, then ginning up panic just because we uh, don't like the president or I don't know, because we want attention or because we want to be a part of this kind of chaotic conversation, this cacophony of craziness uh, that is on the, the uh, the panicking reactionary side of this. Uh, then that's not loving to those around us. Like I said, that's not good for anyone to have a disproportionate 
uh, reaction to this. And then on the other side, being complacent, pretending like it's not a big deal, not taking the necessary precautions. There are people, there are people online, there are people that are probably going to comment on this YouTube video that are saying, I'm not doing anything differently. Sure, I have a cough, but it's my it's my choice. I've actually seen people say, you know, it's their choice if people are sick and they want to go out. Yes, of course, it's technically their choice. I don't believe people should be punished by law, but there are people who are resisting because they either don't like the CDC, they don't trust authority, or they truly do think that this thing is just a way to, uh, I don't know, they just think that it is some kind of hoax. If there is anyone on that side and they're resisting washing their hands more or not going out in public or taking necessary precautions, that's also not loving because you might be able to fight off the sickness, but you might be around people who are going to be around other people who can't. Either they're around their grandparents or they're around some kind of immunosuppressed person. They're around someone with cancer. And if someone has diabetes, if they've got heart disease, if they've got a lung disease, if they've got cancer and they contract uh, this virus, then they are pretty much done for. So in order to be considerate, in order to be compassionate, we have to be somewhere in the middle. And this is almost always the case when it comes to any kind of reaction that both sides of the extreme spectrum, both sides of the spectrum that are extremes are wrong. That the truth, that the compassionate approach lies somewhere in the middle. That uh, we as Christians, we cannot resort to panic when it comes to something like this because as scary as this epidemic might seem, and there is justified fear surrounding it, the fact of the matter is, is that God is still on his throne, that he knew that this was coming, that he is sovereign, that he is in control, that he is not freaking out, that nothing surprises God. Nothing is unexpected. Nothing Nothing makes him go, oh gosh, I started something that went way too far. I don't know how we're going to do this. Okay, guys, let me call in the cleaning crew and we got to kind of figure this out. Let's strategize. That's not what God does. He doesn't come in and clean up the mess. He is sovereign over all of it. He is not bound by time. And so he is uh, completely, he completely has a, a perfectly controlled grasp over the entire situation. Remember, the Bible says not even a sparrow falls out of the sky apart from the Father's will. And so uh, we have to trust that God is good, that God is faithful, that God knows what he's doing. But just because we know uh, that God is good, not even but, I would say and, we know that God is good and faithful and in control and that calms our anxieties, that calms our fears. Uh, we can have peace. We can even have joy in this tribulation, in this trial, especially if you are someone who is affected by this. You are very much in a trial right now. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't prepare. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take precautions. Of course we could. We trust fully in the Lord, doing what we can to be good stewards of our bodies, to be good stewards of our families, to be good stewards of our resources, uh, to do everything we can to be as compassionate as possible to those around us. And being compassionate to those around us means not going outside when you're sick, not going to public places, if you can at all avoid it, washing your hands very thoroughly, covering your coughs, uh, doing things that are uh, considerate of other people as well as your uh, own ability to fight off this sickness. I, I don't think we talked about this on Monday as well. I don't think that we need to be, you know, buying a, a ton of toilet paper and paper towels and things like that. But if you need to add a multivitamin to your diet or to someone else's or to your family's diet, more vitamin A, more vitamin D, if you're trying to get more time in the sun uh, to make sure that you have that vitamin D, more vitamin C, uh, echinacea, whatever it is, I, I think that that is very wise. That's very prudent. That is using the resources that God has given you, that God has given us uh, to do what we can, but realize that we can take all the multivitamins in the world, that we can be as prepared as possible. We can drink all the water, get all the sunlight that we possibly can, and still, and still uh, know that God is 
completely sovereign and in control and we are not. There are things that we cannot control. There are things that we cannot know. And if uh, this pandemic is any indication, there are things that we cannot predict. And so we do what we can. Uh, We stay inside when we need to. We, yes, we might need to avoid travel at some point. Like we might need to avoid our kids actually being in the physical classroom. We might need to actually avoid meetings. We might need to actually avoid large sporting events. I'm not saying we have to do that right now or that everyone is obligated to do all of those things right now, but it is not... uh, it, it's not unrealistic for us to, to for us to uh, be mildly inconvenienced for the sake of our health and for the sake of others' health. We also need to pray not just for our families and ourselves, but pray for people who are uh, pray for the homeless. Pray for those who don't have any defenses whatsoever. So, what are they going to do uh, if there's some kind of quarantine? What are they going to do if they have coronavirus and they don't know it? Not only what is that going to do for them, but what is that going to do to all the people that are around them? Uh, Let's pray for the Christians in Iran. Pray for the Christians in China. Pray for the Christians in Japan, in South Korea, these highly infected places. Uh, Pray that God God would protect them, uh, keep them healthy, protect the church, but also that they would have a joy, that they would have a peace uh, throughout these trials, throughout this sickness, that other people would notice and that the gospel would spread even faster than the coronavirus does, that uh, it would catch on like wildfire, that even as coronavirus is hurting people's bodies, that Jesus would be saving people's uh, souls. And like I said, or like we have said, uh, God is completely sovereign. Nothing can happen apart from his will, but he has ordained people to pray, has ordained people uh, to spread the gospel. And there is nothing, no sickness, no famine, uh, no government policy that can stop, that can hinder God's will from being done. And God's will is that we spread the gospel. So that's another prayer that we can pray. We should be praying all of those things. And we should be praying for God to, this is something I prayed this morning, that God would thwart the evil plans of regimes that are trying to make this, uh, trying to use this situation to oppress their own people and try to even oppress the people outside of their country. So for China, for example, they are now demanding an apology from any countries that have criticized them. They actually specifically called out a Fox News host Uh, saying that because a Fox News host actually said China should apologize for this. And he's right because China didn't allow in world health officials or American health officials when we tried to help several weeks ago because they wanted to save face because communism, commie's going to commie. Communism is going to communism. That's what they're going to do. That is why the Chinese outbreak has been so bad. But the Chinese Communist Party, who is solely and exclusively concerned with their own image, not at all concerned with the well-being of their people, they are saying everyone else needs to apologize. And oh, by the way, Tucker Carlson reported this on his show Monday night. Oh, by the way, we might withhold medical supplies that you guys need because in all of our stupidity over the years, America has decided that we need to rely heavily on China, not just for medical supplies, but for lots and lots of things. Our economies are so inextricably intertwined that China can make a threat which is actually credible and say, hey, we're going to cut off a lot of the medical supplies that we give you guys, a lot of the ingredients for things like antibiotics, and good luck. Good luck with this epidemic. Good luck with your other sicknesses until you bow down to us, basically, until you say sorry to us, until uh, you stop restrictions on travel or whatever it is, this is what we're going to do. I mean, this is a type of biological warfare. But look, America, y'all know that I love America. We did get ourselves into this mess by depending so much on China for so many years that they are able to actually threaten something like this. And we have to either, com- uh, well, maybe we don't have to comply, but we actually have to fear a threat like like that for them to say we're going to withhold the ingredients that we supply to you guys for making antibiotics antibiotics that in a lot of cases uh, save people's lives and stop not the coronavirus but other sicknesses from getting worse and turning into something else that really truly is like i said life threatening 
So that's terrifying. And I have prayed that God would thwart any kind of plans, that God would thwart any kind of uh, evil that any regime is trying to is trying to put forth and use to hurt people even more than they already have. The Chinese Communist Party is also saying that, hey, look, um, we don't know where it started. We don't know where it started. Some people are saying it started here, but we're the victims here. We didn't perpetrate this. Okay, okay, that's not true. We know that it started in Wuhan. We don't know specifically how it started. Probably a wild animal market, but there are other theories out there as well. And yes, this the reason why this spread is because the Communist Party didn't take care of it how they should have and when they should have. I mean, there were journalists that are now imprisoned, by the way, by the Chinese Communist Party, or not even journalists, I think just citizens that took videos of what is going on in the hospitals, of people quarantined inside their home, unable to get health care. What was going on inside their hospitals is that Chinese doctors and nurses uh, were saying, I've been awake for an entire week and I can't help these people anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm not getting the resources. I'm not getting the support that I need. I, I am not, uh, we are not getting any help from the government here. We're just kind of left here to do whatever we can. I mean, these doctors and nurses absolutely distraught and body bags upon body bags. The citizens who took videos of that to show you what's really going on in China with the coronavirus got sent to jail. And now because communists are communists, they're coming out and saying, oh, you guys need to apologize to us. We've actually done a great job. This is communism. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I was actually just reading Ronald Reagan's book, An American Life, where he talks about China in the 1980s and how there was a hopeful turn towards free markets and towards capitalism and away from communism. And he had this hope that maybe China would embrace freedom. And China did embrace free markets in order to fund its communism, but it is not free. People are not only persecuted, uh, they are killed, they are slaughtered. Muslims and Christians, they're sent to basically concentration camps. The organs of people who are in these camps are harvested for Chinese research. China is a bad actor in the world. And we don't need any moral relativism from people saying, I mean, it's just amazing. People, Chris Hayes, for example, saying it is absolutely disgusting. It is disgusting to call this a Wuhan virus. It's disgusting. There was another uh, NBC person who said this is disgusting to call this a uh, you know, the Chinese coronavirus, or it is, it's racist to, to call it that. Was it racist to say West Nile virus? Was it waste, racist to say Ebola, which is named after, I, I think it's a river in Africa. Like, is it racist to call a virus by the name of where the virus actually originated? And I actually think that it's important to do that. So we remember where the origin is. I'm not saying that America has been perfect in this. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we shouldn't do the same. If something originated in America, like, fine, call it whatever, you know, wherever city it originated in. I think it's actually important for us to remember in this particular case, who was responsible, maybe not for the start of this virus, but who is responsible for the spread of this virus and for us to remember the detrimental effects of communism. Uh, for us to not let China off the hook and for us to remind our elected officials to do what they can to extricate uh, America from China so we are not so wholly dependent on such a bad actor. I am really unconcerned with like superficial uh, worries about, oh, is it racist to say where this virus originated? I don't think Chinese people are bad like, I don't think that they are inherently more apt to give us a virus. There's nothing about that at all. This is about the Chinese uh, communist regime, which not only is a bad actor on the world stage, but also oppresses its own people. Again, this is just the insanity of social justice, never looking at both sides of the equation, always looking at the most like virtue signally, superficial, shallow thing to be mad at and never looking at the fact that, you know, maybe it's fine. Like maybe Maybe it's fine for us to criticize the Communist Party that is hurting its own people as well, that is hurting Muslims, that is hurting Christians, that is hurting secular people in China by not allowing them any freedom whatsoever and not offering the resources that they need to. Funnily enough, uh, 
Chris Hayes, the guy who said it was disgusting to call this the Wuhan virus, tweeted like a day earlier, are there any good books on the Spanish flu? Oh, the Spanish flu. Oh, no, that is very racist of you to even bring up the Spanish flu. We actually don't call it the Spanish flu. We call it um, something much more scientific, Chris Hayes. So how dare you? How dare you? dare you. Uh, Okay, so I said that we weren't going to talk about the coronavirus for very long, and here we go. We talked about it for a really long time, but that's because it's important, and I want you guys to avoid being on the extremes. Like I said, be cautious, be considerate, be compassionate, Uh, but we don't need to be a part of the chaos. We don't need to be a part of the pandemonium. God is on his throne. We take whatever precautions that we can uh, in wisdom. We limit the activities that we need to limit without, uh, you know, living in isolation and in fear. So, okay, that's all I wanted to say about that. Now, let me get to this because if I don't get to this, then we'll never get to it because I've been saying for two weeks. Okay, so AOC. AOC was in a hearing for a woman who identifies as a man. It was a congressional hearing. And uh, this particular woman, I have to get these things straight. So a woman who identifies as a man, uh, he is suing a hospital, a Catholic hospital, because the Catholic hospital would not do a hist- perform a hysterectomy on this woman who identifies as a man Uh, because it is against their religious beliefs. There was no medical reason for her hysterectomy. It was simply because she wanted to feel more like a man, even though you could remove every single organ from your body if you wanted to, and it still would not make you a man, like you would still be a woman. Uh, So AOC goes on this rant, and I'm just going to play you uh, a few seconds of it. It's very difficult to sit here and listen to arguments in the long history of this country of using scripture and weaponizing and abusing scripture to justify bigotry. White supremacists have done it. Those who justified slavery did it. Those who fought against integration did it. And we're seeing it today. So you see how she turns the idea of religious liberty on its head by saying that people are using the argument of religious liberty or are using the Bible or are using religion in order to hate people, in order to discriminate against people. Her argument, she says, is that everyone is holy, that everyone is sacred, and that we have to treat people as if they're holy and refusing a woman who identifies as a man the removal of her uterus. Um, is bigoted, is wrong, and it's done in the name of religion, but it's just thinly veiled, uh, you know, transphobia or whatever she would say. Well, first of all, obviously her theology is off. We know that AOC's theology is off. If her theology was on point, she wouldn't be a socialist. If she believed what the Bible said, Uh, She wouldn't believe in abortion. She would also believe in the inerrancy and the authority of scripture, which said, which says that God made them man and female. She would understand that God defined marriage, that God defines morality, that he says what is and what isn't, what's right and what's wrong. But AOC doesn't believe that. AOC is a moral relativist who uses uh, Jesus to advance her political agenda in a way that's convenient, but not correct. Uh, So her remark that everyone is holy, everyone is sacred. That's obviously not a biblical remark. Now, she identifies as a Catholic, and I don't know enough about Catholic theology to know if all Catholics believe that, but that's not actually a a biblical perspective. Not everyone is holy. Everyone is valuable. Everyone is made in the image of God, and therefore we are valuable than any plant and any other animal. We've talked about that a lot, but Uh, Not everyone is holy. People who are Christians, people who are in Christ are holy. They are sacred. That means set apart. So they are different because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, not because of any good that they've actually contributed. But even if it were true that everyone is holy, which like I said, isn't biblically correct, that does not force a Catholic hospital to remove a woman's uterus just because she decides uh, she feels like she is a man. When that Catholic hospital 
abides by the word of God, which says very clearly that the Lord made them male and female. And so what she's trying to do is turn it on its head and say, uh, religious people are discriminating. That's not loving. That's not sacred. That's not holy. That's not right. Whatever it is. The, the real perspective of that, she's trying to go at it from the wrong and unconstitutional perspective. The real constitutional, logical perspective on that is that by saying that this this Catholic hospital has to perform a hysterectomy, a non-medically necessary hysterectomy on someone who identifies as a man means that you are forcing people, you are forcing Americans who have a First Amendment right to the freedom of religion, you are forcing Americans to go against uh, their religiously held beliefs. You are forcing them to abide by your religion, AOC and leftists, which is secularism, which again goes against the First Amendment, which prohibits any establishment of religion. See, they like to think the people who are against these religious freedom arguments because they believe that it's just another name for bigotry. Uh, these people like to claim that, oh, you know, religion doesn't have a place in the public square. Well, what do you call the thing that you're propagating? It's a religion by the name of secularism. They are forcing secularism on people who hold sincere religious beliefs, who are Christians, who are Catholics, who abide by the word of God and say, you have to be a secularist. You have to pretend that there is no God who is a moral authority. You have to, you can believe those things. You can believe those things, which the left likes to reduce religious liberty to just your privately held beliefs, but you're not actually allowed to act on those things. You're not actually allowed to abide by the Bible. You have to push those to the side when it comes to your job. This is the same thing with the florist in Colorado, Jack Phillips. They said you have to bake this cake for this uh, gay couple who is getting married, even though it goes against his religious beliefs. Uh, they believe that you should push those religious beliefs to the side. You should abide by secularism and you should do whatever they say. If AOC says that it's fine for a woman to identify as a man and uh, take her uterus out in an effort, a failed effort to be more like a man, then you Catholic hospital, you have to believe that too. And if AOC or if Pete Buttigieg says that, oh, life begins at first breath. And so abortion up to nine months is fine, according to the Bible. Well, then their absolutely inane interpretation of the Bible must be yours publicly too. So don't let AOC or anyone else, uh, shame you or convince you that you're the extremist, that you're the religious bigot. They're the religious bigots and they're, uh, they're, Religion is secularism. Their religion is agnosticism. I know both Pete Buttigieg and AOC identify as Christians, but they believe that you should not. If you are someone who actually takes the word of God seriously, you should not be able to live out your beliefs uh, in the public square. You shouldn't. One day it will be that we shouldn't even talk about those things. And we already kind of see that there are certain states that say, oh, it's hate speech for a pastor from a pulpit to say say that, you know, marriage is between one man and one woman. Uh, we hear about conversion therapy being banned, which is really just counselors saying, uh, telling people who maybe they have same sex attraction and they don't want to because they know it's against God's word. And so a counselor being able to say, you know, here's what God's word says about this. Here's what we can do. Here's how we can pray in a very loving and gentle and compassionate way. There are states like Virginia, like California saying that that is banned. Uh, so the left, including AOC, they believe that you should not have have the liberty as a religious person to actually act out your beliefs. Yes, discrimination. I know that's a scary word, but discrimination uh, is something in certain cases that is allowed according to your religious beliefs. Like a church or a private school that is a Christian private school should not be forced to hire a person who. Uh, whose lifestyle does not abide by the worldview and the perspective, the biblical perspective that those institutions have. And I think it goes the same for hospitals. Now, should we as Christians love everyone? Uh, 
Yes, in that we should show compassion towards everyone. We care about them knowing Jesus. We see them as people made in the image of God. We know that no matter someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, that they are equally as valuable as us in that they are made in the image of God. But does that fact mean that we have to be compelled and forced by the government to provide services that go against our sincerely held beliefs? No. No. So AOC, unfortunately, doesn't understand this. I would like her to look at the countries in which religious liberty has been hindered throughout history. How has that worked out for people? Not just Christians, not just people with other beliefs, uh, but people who are secularists like she is, uh, people who are atheists and agnostics. It never works well when the government tries to limit uh, people's religious freedom. Again, it is the religion of progressivism, the religion of secularism that they are trying to establish as the national religion. It's going to get harder and harder uh, for Christians to be Christians in the public square, to speak like Christians, to act like Christians in the public square, when this idea that you can't actually be a Christian out in public or in how you conduct your work, when this idea becomes mainstream. And we have to speak up about it now. And we can't be afraid. We can't be afraid uh, because we are obligated, uh, just as uh, Daniel did when he was ordered not to pray and he prayed in the Bible. We are obligated to follow God, uh, not follow institutions made by man. We are called to follow the Lord, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, We are willing to follow God no matter what, as frightening as it can be. But as long as we are here, we should be advocating for and fighting for religious liberty, not just for us and what we believe, but for everyone. Uh, Okay, that's all I have time for today. I know that we had other... Uh, we had other things that we were talking about this Friday. I am finally interviewing Lila Rose. You guys have asked me to interview her. We're going to talk about a ton of things. We're going to talk about uh, abortion, obviously, but we're going to talk about uh, birth control. We'll probably touch on IVF. And we are also going to talk about some of the differences in Catholicism and Protestantism. She is a Catholic and so should be a really good discussion. And I look forward to you guys listening to it. I will see you then. 